Shalom, everyone. And the Nazarene, that's what we're called. There's something for the masses to see, and then there's something for the initiated to see. It's the darkness hiding in open view. We call them Wiccans, witches, warlocks, wizards, shamans. That's what they go by. It's poison doctrine. started here. Uh, this is going to be recorded on a video, so uh, if there's uh, questions, let's make sure that we can uh, raise our voices, raise our voices loud enough so that the camera can pick up the voice. I'll try to repeat the question. If I don't repeat the question that you might have or comment that you have, uh, please ask me to repeat it so that the recording will have that important question or, or comment. Welcome. Uh, thank you for those that came from a long distance and for those that got up early and came down here because we've been getting them started about 10 o'clock now. And uh, I especially want to thank, uh, you know, all the people that came to visit us during this Sukkoth. And I remember Sukkoth is, of course, the time that Yahushua was really born, born on the first day and circumcised on the eighth day. And um, so those that say we don't really know when he was born, then we can come back and explain that to them and say, but we do know, you know, not everybody knows. Uh, on the earth, there's um, basically most people are under, with the understanding that the denominations, various things like Catholics, Baptists, Seventh-day Adventists, uh, and so forth, Amish, uh, were denominations that existed during the time of the apostles or the emissaries. Uh, and certainly uh, they believe that Yahushua founded this assembly. And that's not true at all because the assembly of Yahuwah has always been Yisrael. And y Yahushua is the high priest of this way, this faith. And the faith is what we're going to be discussing today. <clears throat> the uh, time of the, of the apostles and of course Yahushua's walk on the earth there were no denominations other than sects uh, or in the Greek word heresis, which we get the word heresy from. The sects of uh, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, and some people say the sect at the Qumran assembly. But, um, and there were probably others too. Uh, the Herodians. <clears throat> anyway, uh, along came the Gnostics and then the, the, the Christians. Uh, centuries after, you know. Uh, the Christians didn't exist in the first century, and that's kind of a shock to people when they hear that. They go, wait a minute. But anyway, let's look at the original faith. And uh, there's going to be a test. Uh, in fact, uh, the scriptures actually tell us to test ourselves, to test ourselves to see whether or not we are in the faith, which is the walk or the way. And um, Anyway, we're going to try to find out what the truth is. Scripture does tell us that. And we're going to examine a lot of Scripture here and very little tradition. The seminar is going to use some terms that most of you are familiar with, but very quickly we're going to run down this list. Those that are viewing this on a DVD can just slow their control down and, and review this. The word L-O-R-D, uh, we're not going to use that because that's a replacement term. The real name that's in the text is Yahuwah with four Hebrew letters. Yod, He, Ua, He. The name of the Mashiach or the Messiah uh, is not J-E-S-U-S. -S. That's less than 500 years old as of this recording. And if you said Jesus, it would mean the horse in Hebrew. Sus is horse. Yahusha is what the, we're going to refer to him as, and that name means Yah is our salvation or our deliverer. Christos will be avoided because that's Greek. Why would we call ourselves by a Greek term? We're the nation of Israel in the covenant with Yahuwah. Not to be hateful, but 
Christos is, is Greek, and we're speaking English, so we're babbling somewhat. I'm sorry about all that. This uh, noise is uh, because of the mic. Uh, yeah, it, it's up here. Yeah, It has a lot to do with this controller that I'm holding. We're going to use the term Mashiach, and that's a Greek transliteration that we know of as Messiah. The Greek doesn't have an SH sound, so they had to double the S. Uh, the term G-O-D was the term that was used by the Teutonic tribes. They were pagans, and it referred to superhuman beings of heathen myth. So we're not going to use that term, because when Christianity uh, embraced the Teutonic tribes, they adopted that term. We're going to use the original Hebrew term that means mighty one. El or Elohim. Uh, the term Jews, which people think that is, you know, there's Christians and there's Jews. Well, there's, uh, that's one tribe. That's the royal tribe that the kings came from. The Jews are going to be referred to by their proper name, Yahudim, which means worshipers or praisers of Yah. The name Yah is in their name. It's, the, it's from the man Yehuda the man who was the son of Yisrael. Now, Yisrael is uh, a nation of priests that comprise technically 13 tribes. They descend from uh, a man named Yaakov who was renamed Yisrael, and Yisrael actually means prince of El, or prince, or rule, rule with El, prince or ruler with El. Anyway, all the tribes of Israel, or Yisrael, are lost. Uh, there's some that know who they are. They're the older brother. They haven't left the father's household. But the rest of those lost tribes are the prodigal sons and daughters. The prodigal left the father's house and has been living in the nations, as the parable explains, and has not had bread, because the bread is Torah. They left. And that's what we're going to call the law. The Torah are the instructions of the Father. And they're both moral and ceremonial. The ceremonial ones are being done and have been done and will be done by Yahushua, the high priest. But the moral code or the moral side of the law, which is the Ten Commandments and the other prescriptions that we're given to live by, in Leviticus 11, for example, the clean and unclean, and, and uh, the festivals at uh, Deuteronomy 16, and Leviticus or Wayikra chapter 23. These are all things that Yisrael must abide by, you know. And those uh, festivals, of course, we just finished the, the tr festival of Sukkoth, and that is one of the things that's still yet ahead. It's a shadow of things that were to come. They're the uh, the framework or the shadows of deliverance. It's actually the redemption plan. The redemption plan is mirrored in those seven annual festivals. And uh, Christianity has abandoned all those and changed the laws. Now, uh, it's not about, uh, I mean, it is about legal, le a legal standing before you. We want to be legal. We're actually wanting to be legalistic. Because when we're legal, that means that we're pleasing to Father Yahuwah. And we love his commandments, so therefore we obey them. And Revelation 14 and Revelation 12 both describe us as those who obey the commandments of Elohim and hold to the testimony of Yahushua. We're the first fruits. We're called Nazarim. That's a prophetic term from Yermiyahu chapter 31. Watchmen will arise on the hills of Ephraim in the last days. And they will, you know, go back to the Torah is what they'll be going back to. That's the prodigal son returning to the father's household. And then it, it picks it up again in Acts chapter 24, verse 5. A, a prosecutor is pursuing Paul to get him arrested, or keep him under arrest and, 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 pen, and punished. And he calls this, this sect the Nazarim. He said that this fellow, Shaul, is a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarim. Acts chapter 24, verse 5. And it's also mentioned when Shaul goes to Rome, when he's 
addressing his fellow Yahudim, he says that, uh, well, they re reply to him and, and they say that this sect is spoken against everywhere, but they did want to hear about it from Shaul to see what he thought about it. Well, we're going to talk about this sect which kept the faith, the faith which we're going to discuss today. Now, if there's going to be a test, which we all will undergo, in fact, our life is itself a test, what are we going to be tested on? So if a teacher or a rabbi, which we have one, Yahushua, is going to teach us something, what would that rabbi want us to, to know in order to pass the test? In, in uh, Timothy 3, we, we read these words. But evil men and imposters shall go on to the worse. They're going to get worse and worse. Leading astray and being led astray themselves. But you, he's speaking to Timothy and to us, stay in what you have learned and trusted, having known from whom you have learned, and that from a babe you have known the set-apart scriptures, which are able to make you wise for deliverance through belief in Messiah Yahushua. All scripture is breathed by Elohim and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for setting straight, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of Elohim might be fitted, equipped for every good work. Now, being led astray, what we're being led astray from is ultimately the teachings, the instructions, which is the word of Yahuwah, which is called truth. Now, if there's to be a test, what are we to be tested on? Well, we're to be tested upon truth. In our mouth, there's not, there's not supposed to be found any guile, which is, of course, deceit. Now, Ecclesiastes chapter 12 t tells us this. Here's the conclusion of the entire matter. Fear Elohim and guard, that's the Hebrew word shamar down here, 8104, his commands. For this applies to all mankind. For Elohim shall bring every work into judgment, which is the word for, um, you know, mishpat, verdict, determination of error. So we're going to have to know what our test is going to be on to determine whether we're having errors on our final exam or our life or not. Now, it says here, including all that is hidden, whether good or whether evil. Now, uh, to begin our walk is we engraft into Israel, or the prodigal son comes back to the covenant from the nations, in the nations, while still in the nations. You're not going anywhere, but you're going to step out of the world of Pharaoh back into Yahuwah's realm by immersion. And at that point, you're pledging something. You're pledging your life and your property and everything, just like the founding fathers of this country pledged everything they had. The pledge that we're entering into, though, is with our Creator. Someone standing over us and holding us and dipping us into water, and what they're saying doesn't have any bearing upon us. It's what we feel and believe and speak from our heart that matters at that point of immersion. So, anyway, the pledge is our immersion. And in Mark 16, we see this. And he said to them, go into all the world. This is a commission that we're given that's an eternal thing that we're having to do until the end, of course, is the Nazarene are to go into the world and proclaim the good news to every creature. That's about the death, burial, and resurrection of Yahushua, as well as the fact that we have to teach them the, the Torah. You see, the good news is essentially the covenant itself. Uh, he who has believed, that means obeyed and believed, and has been immersed shall be saved, but he who has not believed shall be condemned. Now, if you understand the word believe the good news, it means believed and obeyed, not just the, the Greek idea, but the Hebrew idea of, of to trust to believe, a man shall live by his amuna, that's Habakkuk, uh, and that means his walk is going to be evidence of what he believes, like our brother James, or Jacob wrote, that uh, faith without works is dead. So you have to have evidence of the, what you believe. 
So this is the message that's proclaimed, the good news, which is, you know, to obey the covenant. Repent, for the reign of Yahuwah draws near. Now, immersed refers to our circumcision of our heart, done by Messiah, Mashiach, and it's the entry into the covenant, and it's a pledge of a good conscience toward Yahuwah. And at that point, we become a citizen of Yisrael to partake of the promises. Now, that's very important for Gentiles to understand because we've been living as the prodigal son, but we're coming to our senses and realizing we were dispersed over 2,700 years ago from Israel by the Assyrians. And then subsequently, 135 year, years later, by the Babylonians. So all the tribes have been sent into the nations. Now, the ones that were captured and taken back to Babylon and somewhat 70 years later came back, were allowing for the birth of the Messiah and all that, but that's only a small, tiny remnant. And that's the older brother that never left the covenant. Now the prodigal coming back to the covenant has to, be, has to overcome his arrogance because he's a very arrogant child. <laughs> and he doesn't like his brother either. Uh, the older brother doesn't like the younger brother. That's the prodigal son. Now, the, at the end, the differences between the righteous and the unrighteous will become more and more pronounced as time goes along. It says in Revelation 22, He who does wrong, let him do more wrong. He who is filthy, let him be more filthy. He who is righteous, let him be more righteous. And he who is set apart, let him be more set apart. And see, I am coming speedily, and my reward is with me, to give to each according to his work. And down at the bottom, you'll see the uh, little pictures here. The modern-day rulers of the world, which I, everyone probably, well, not everyone, but there's a lot of people that recognize the modern-day Haman as being uh, Ahmadinejad in uh, Iran, and here he is hugging the most powerful man in the world. And they're really good friends because they're brothers. They're, they're a member of the brotherhood. Uh, that's amazing, isn't it? And then we've got homosexual judges, you know, making interpretations and setting up things uh, the way they like it. So uh, anyway, this man, Ahmadinejad, is a modern-day Haman. He wants to see Israel wiped off the map. And that's exactly the spirit of Haman. In uh, Matthew chapter 5, Yahushua proclaimed these words to a large group. Do not think that I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. I did not come to destroy, but to complete. For truly, I say to you, till the heaven and the earth pass away, one yod or one tittle shall by no means pass from the Torah till all be done. Whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands, that means to set, set it aside, to set it aside or to, um, well, you know, loose it. Or to, well, you know, binding and loosing. It would be to bind it, yeah. To, if you bind something, it means that it's to be obeyed. If you loose it, it's, to, it's permitted. So he would, he would be explaining that in their terms. Uh, Christians uh, have been uh, at a loss to understand these words. But whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches men so shall be called least in the reign of the heavens. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the reign of the heavens. Now his first coming down at the bottom, I've got the word atonement and the word redemption. Our redemption draws near but it has not yet occurred. That's when we're to be born. Right now we are begotten. The seed has been put into us. We're still in the birth stages, but we're in the womb, so to speak. So we've been begotten, but we're not yet born. When he first came, he came to atone. Now when he comes again and returns, he's going to be redeeming us. And all the universe groans for the appearing of the sons and daughters of Yahuwah. Anyway, Psalm 80 would be one that, if you take notes, uh, look at that. Because it's uh, something about the restoration that you're seeing right now. It's a prayer, a song, but it's a sung prayer. And it's about the restoration of Ephraim, and Benjamin, and Manasseh, 
those are tribes that are mentioned. They're not Jews. Uh, they're actually the, the prodigal. Now, truth has fallen in the streets, and we, we see that in Yeshayahu chapter 11. Uh, no, 59, I'm sorry, 59. I was thinking about another verse. Chapter 11 is talking about how Ephraim and uh, Yehuda are vexing one another, and that's what's happening. That's the older brothers coming back. I mean, when the younger brother comes back to the household, the older brother, he's jealous, you know, because he's getting all this attention. Anyway, uh, in Yeshayahu 59, Isaiah 59, and right ruling is driven back and righteousness stands far off. For truth has fallen in the street and right is unable to enter. And the truth is lacking. And whoever turns away from evil makes himself a prey. And Yahuwah saw and it displeased him that there was no right ruling. Now, the truth is, of course, Yahuwah's word. And if something was true, 5,000 years ago, then it would be true now, you know, and it would be true in another million years too. So truth is truth. It means to be steadfast and unwavering. Here's a picture of uh, Pilate, and, and he's uh, talking to the crowds, and he's back and forth with Yahusha, and I put the pumpkin on his head because uh, he's, a, he's a serious pagan. Anyway, he, uh, he asked Yahusha, what is truth? You know, he's a pumpkin head. He doesn't know. All right. It's Yahushua's voice is what it is. But what, is, what does his voice represent? In Yahukanan or John 18, Then Pilate said to him, You are a sovereign then? Yahushua answered, You say it, because I am a sovereign. For this I was born, and for this I have come into the world, that I should bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Now, in John chapter 14, Yahushua said to him, I am the way, not a way, and the truth and the life. Now, all three of those things are the same thing. No one comes to the Father except through me. And in, in, in the high priestly prayer in Yahushua in chapter 17, we see he's asking the Father to set them apart in your truth. Now, the, your truth is the covenant. We're going to look at the covenant here in just a few moments. Your word is truth. Now, the word that he always refers to, obeying his word, is the truth. And it's also his voice. And it's his instructions. And we're going to call that word by what he calls it, the, the Torah. That's the instruction. Now, he's continuing in this prayer. As you sent me into the world, okay, I also send them. That's the Nazarene. And believe me, he's talking to you that are sitting here, this little flock. You are Nazarene if you follow Yahushua, if you are the first fruits, if you obey the commandments of Elohim and hold to the testimony of Yahushua. I also sent them into the world. He sends, is sending us. And for them, I set myself apart so that they too might be set apart in truth. And I do not pray for these alone, but also for those believing in me through their word, so that they might all be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, so that they too might be one in us so that the world might believe that you have sent me. So we know that, that he is sending us into the world. Now, the test is what this discussion is really all about. And the test, we have to know what the instructions are in order to pass. So if we, if we know what the Torah is, which are the instructions, then we will pass the test if we've allowed him to sow a love for that upon our hearts. In Colossians 2, it says, See to it that no one makes you a prey, a prey of you through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary matters of the world, and not according to Mashiach. See, lawlessness has become institutionalized. The, you hear him saying it on the radio more and more. Legalist, legalism. Oh, but le being legal is very good, actually. Because if you're legal, that means that you're not illegal. Now, righteousness is going to be revealed. 
Here we have uh, Barney Fife. He's a classic example of a failure, but a uh, comic failure. Anyway, the, we're going to look at a couple of Greek words here real quick. In 2 Corinthians 13, it says, examine yourselves whether you are in the belief. That means the faith. If you're in the faith, or whether you're not, to prove yourselves. Now, the word prove <coughs> is dokimazo, Greek 1381, and it means to test, prove, or examine. Examine yourself to see whether you're in the faith. That's why we talked about uh, the fact that there were no Catholics or Baptists or uh, Seventh-day Adventists or Presbyterians or anything like that when Yahushua walked the earth. He didn't found any of those religions. Those are denominations. He didn't found any religion. He was actually the uh, high priest and is the high priest of Yisrael. And we're all priests and, we're, and we've always been supposed to teach the nations the Torah. That's what Israel's commission is. And he just re-gave re us the commission. Anyway, it says, or do you, not, do you not know yourselves that Yehusha Mashiach, or Messiah, is in you unless you are disapproved? The word disapproved has the word dokimos in it, which is related to that other word. The A at the beginning of a Greek word means it's against, or it's the opposite. It's uh, in front of the word and it negate, and negates the primary word. Now, a dokimos, Greek number 96, means a failure or worth, worthless. It's a castaway, a reprobate, a drift, unapproved, thrown away, an outcast. Now, uh, if we're disapproved or an outcast, then that means that we don't have Mashiach in us. We have to get him to come into us, and we will not get that until we repent. We have to repent, and some receive him before they're immersed. Some receive him after they are, he, they're immersed. And they also receive him in different stages and layers. He gives more. Those who have will be given more and more. Those who have little or none, what, even what they think they have will be taken away from them. He's not talking about money. When you hear preachers talk, say he talked about money, well, he used that as an example. But his real message is a spiritual message. Now, to pass the test, we need the perfect set of instructions. Now, Christianity has thrown these instructions away, okay? And it's sad because, you know, they are, they, I mean, after all, the masqueraders, uh, the demons of, I mean, the, the ones that, uh, that, that Satan has sent into the world that masquerade as angels of light are masquerading. <clears throat> but uh, if, uh, if I'm trying to deceive you, by making you believe that you have to obey the instructions of Yahuwah, well, would I be an enemy of Satan or his friend? Well, ask yourself that. But if I am deceiving you and you actually do start living by the Ten Commandments and, and the other instructions, then you're going to have to stand before the throne and say, oh, I, I loved your commandments. You know, they're truth then he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. But if some deceiver has told you, now you can keep these over here, but um, this, these over here, they're, too, they're for Jewish people. Oh, is that right? Well, where's that written exactly? Uh, anyway, the Torah is Hebrew for instructions. And if this is truth, and it, it has not changed, and it is still truth. Now, in uh, the prophet, what we, they call him... Uh, Joshua, but his real name is Yahusha. Uh, his first name was Husha, then Moshe changed it in the book of Numbers to Yahusha. Anyway, uh, he was the successor of Moshe. In chapter 1, he says, Do not let this book of the Torah depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you guard to do according to all that is written in it. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and act wisely. Okay, that's the faith. This is the faith. To depart from the Torah is to be led astray, okay, from the truth. <clears throat> Doers of the word. In the book of Jacob, or James, that's Yahushua's half-brother. They had the same mother, but different fathers. In chapter 1, after he addressed this to the scattered tribes of Israel, he said, therefore, put away all filthiness and overflow of evil and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your lives and become doers of the word 
and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Because if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror, for he looks at himself and goes away and immediately forgets what he was like. But he that looked into the perfect Torah, that of freedom, and continues in it, not becoming a hearer that forgets, but a doer of work, this one shall be blessed in the doing of the Torah. So the freedom that he's talking about is freedom from sinfulness. Now here's a question for all the class. By stealth and craftiness and deception, who is it that wants us to disobey the Torah of Yahuwah? Well, let me think. The dragon? The dragon is the one who is the enemy of Yahuwah, and he's also the enemy of the Nazarim, and that's his first fruits, and his bride, which is all of Yisrael combined. So he, his enemy is Yahuwah and his wife. Revelation 12, 9 says, And the great dragon was thrown out, that serpent of old, called the devil and Satan, who leads all the world astray. Now, what did we say that we were being led astray from? Ah, the Torah, the truth. He was thrown out, thrown to the earth, and his messengers were thrown out with him. In Matthew 24, uh, this is the end time prophecies, in, chapter, in verse 24, it says, For false messiahs and false prophets, and those are the messengers that are being, you know, guided by his, uh, you know, his, uh, the dragon's teachings, these false messiahs and false prophets shall arise, and they shall show great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the chosen ones. Now, the chosen ones, of course, are those that are Israel or have been grafted into Israel and have become as native-born. So we have there leading astray in both of those things, leading the whole world astray in Revelation 12. And down here, Yahushua's own words, he says, so as to lead astray. And that's done by leading them astray from his Torah. Outside the covenant, there's no hope. Now, in Ephesians 2, I particularly like this, especially starting with verse 8. But anyway, let's start up at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yahushua, unto good works. That means obeying the commandments, which Elohim prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's the commandments. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called the uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time, when you were a Gentile, you were without Messiah, excluded from the citizenship of Yisrael, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no expectation, and without Elohim in the world. But now, in Messiah Yahushua, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of the Messiah. Now, you're no longer Gentiles once you're immersed because you've pledged your life to obey him, just like you were standing there at Sinai. Now, here's the retelling of the covenant for the lost tribes in the last days. And it's given in that very sense when you read Deuteronomy 5. Verses, beginning at verse 6. Number one, I am Yahuwah, your Elohim. Now that's a little phrase he uses a lot. Who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, out of the house of bondage. You have no other mighty ones against my face. Number two, you do not make for yourself a carved image, any, any likeness of which is in the heavens above, or which is in the earth beneath, or which is in the waters under the earth. You do not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, Yahuwah, your Elohim, I am a jealous owl visiting the crookedness of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing kindness to thousands, to those who love me and guard my commands. Now, pay attention to the word. Pay attention to the word in that, ver in that one sentence, that last sentence. Kindness. That's the word that they call grace. That's the Hebrew word chesed. Okay? And it means unloving, I mean, uh, un unmerited loving kindness. You didn't merit it. It's something that he just gives you. Now, number three, you do not cast the name of Yahuwah, your Elohim, to ruin. For Yahuwah does not leave him unpunished who casts his name to ruin. Now, the word cast and ruin are maybe unfamiliar to you, 
many of you who are either watching this or hearing this now, the word cast is the word NASA, N-A-S-A -A in Hebrew, just like the NASA. It means to throw, like NASA literally throws things into the air. Well, NASA or NASA is uh, the word cast or send or throw. And that means to speak it and throw it, okay, or send it. The ruin word is used twice in this uh, also, and it is the word, Hebrew word shoah. And it means to utterly lay waste, to destroy it utterly. Now that is what you do if you do not use his name. You have destroyed it. And the translators did that when they removed his name and they put in the device L-O-R-D. They took his name out. They removed it. They destroyed it. The third commandment was violated. <clears throat> now number four, let's see what we have here. He blessed this day. Number four is guard the Sabbath day to set it apart as Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you. Six days you labor and shall do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath of Yahuwah your Elohim. You do not do any work, you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your male servant nor your female servant, nor your ox nor your donkey nor any of your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates, so that your male servant and your female servant rest as you do. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim, and that Yahuwah your Elohim brought you out from there by a strong hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, Yahuwah your Elohim commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. He blessed this day. It's still the same day. It never changed. It isn't set by the moon. And a lot of people are out there thinking that it is. But it's not true. The moon was created on the fourth day of creation. And we still love the people that are under the deception, though, that feel like the moon is involved in setting the weekly Sabbaths. But that's not written here. If it were, he would have surely mentioned it. But uh, there's a lot to be said about that, but we, we have to move on here. Uh, number five is respect your father and your mother as Yahuwah your Elohim has commanded you so that your days are prolonged and so that it is well with you on the soil which Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you. Now these begin how we get along with our fellow human beings. The covenant enables us to be brothers and sisters and walk together if we follow these instructions. The first four were how we relate and serve him. Now, you do not murder is number six. Number seven is you do not break wedlock. Number, that's literal. That's exactly what it says. Lo shakak, uh, lakak. Anyway, um, number eight is you do not steal. That's lo ganab, no ganabbing. You do not bear witness, false witness against your neighbor. That's number nine. And number 10 is you do not covet your neighbor's wife, nor do you desire your neighbor's house, his field, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, his ox, nor his donkey, or whatever belongs to your neighbor. Now, the 10th commandment was split into two commandments by the Catholic uh, cir uh, circus and uh, magisterium. You do not covet your neighbor's wife is the ninth commandment, and you do not covet your neighbor's house or goods is the tenth commandment because they wiped out the second commandment. The second commandment has to do with bowing to images and of course they had all these statues so they had to continue that. Now continuing along in that same line from, ver from Deuteronomy 5 right into Deuteronomy 6 hear, this means to Shema, hear and obey O Yisrael Yahuwah our Elohim, Yahuwah is one. And you shall love Yahuwah your Elohim with all your heart and with all your being and with all your might. And these words which I am commanding you today shall be in your heart. They shall be in your heart. And you shall impress them upon your children and shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up and shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes and you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. And that's Debarim or Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. And that's why evolution has become so prevalent because we abandon the commandments. We don't know, I mean, without the moral code, and the laws of Yahuwah, we uh, have got, become reprobate. Uh, our minds have been led astray. 
and uh, they're teaching it in school now and they prohibit these commandments from being taught the truth has fallen in the streets now if you see things from Yahushua's viewpoint instead of yours then you're not in the mind of the flesh you're not in the perspective of your flesh you're in the perspective of how he sees everything if you do Torah then you accept the truth and if you don't do Torah, if you accept the lie that we don't have to obey, then you're rejecting the Torah. And you see that the test involves the Torah. Because the Torah is our, basically our instructions that we're going to be tested on. Now, what we just read, the, the covenant, that's the Torah. And if we don't have that, we're not going to pass the test. And that's why we're here to wake people up and get them to wake up in the pigsty and go back and embrace the, the, the older brother and the father that's waiting for, for us. Now the lie actually began in the Garden of Eden. It was the invention of something called religion. And that is a, a Latin word, religion, which means to rebind. So there was a falling away from obedience and we fell down, I think, in many different ways, but one of the ways that we fell down was we, we were bro our, our linkage with Yahuwah was broken. And religion has been seeking to rebind that, that, you know, for us to reach back up to him. But he's reached down to us and given us his, a love for his, his truth, his, his covenant. Now the tree of knowledge of good and evil is all about religion. It's seeking a way to become like witchcraft, warlocks and witches, to become like Elohim and to become Elohim. In other words, to be able to, to bend things to our bend things to our will. That's what witches seek to do. But witches and, and sorcerers seek to bend reality in, in, to their will. Now, uh, and that means control over the world. And this was promised. To, to Koah, the first woman, if she would just simply obey Satan or the dragon instead of, uh, you know, believing what Yahuwah had said. He said, don't eat from this. Don't eat from the tree of religion. Don't do it. <laughs> now, the old proverb, some of you may not be familiar with this, but it's the enemy of my enemy is my friend. It indicates that when two parties have a common enemy, let's, such as the dragon, then we are on the same side and should be friends. Yahushua put a spin on this old proverb here in Mark 9, and Yachanan said to him, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow us. And Yahushua said, Do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name is able to readily speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is for us. For whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you are of Messiah, truly I say to you, he shall by no means lose his reward. And whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it is better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. Now, here's the consequences of believing the lie, okay? Now, this has everything to do with what we were talking about earlier about religion. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, starting at verse 9, says, The coming of the lawless one, the one that says legalism is bad, being legal, you don't want to be legal. You want to just have faith and trust, but don't obey. You don't have to obey. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power and signs and wonders of falsehood, like sacraments. Yeah, let's find those. Can anybody track those in, in, in Scripture? Well, there are no sacraments. There's no, and therefore, there's no need for that priesthood, is, either, is there? Um, it took me a long time to get over that. So it was of the working of Satan that this was, this was being done. Now, it's uh, with all power and signs and wonders of falsehood and with all deceit of unrighteousness. In other words, tricking you to become unrighteous. In those perishing because they did not receive a love 
of the truth in order for them to be saved. And for this reason, Elohim sends them a working of delusion for them to believe the falsehood, that's the lie, in order that all should be judged who did not believe the truth. So religion is the lie and the Torah is the truth, but have delighted in the unrighteousness. And they do, they celebrate their unrighteousness. A sign follows to test to see if one is deluded. Now here's a sign whether or not you're deluded or not. Now this is to wake you up, okay? It, it has everything to do with what you've been taught, but here it is. Speak also to the children of Yisrael, saying, Surely my Sabbaths you should keep, or guard, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am Yahuwah who sets you apart. So there's only one body, and that is Yisrael, and if we're not in that body, then we have to find out a way to get in. Now, you shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, for it is set apart to you. Everyone who profanes it shall surely be put to death. For whoever does any work on it, that person shall be cut off from among his people. Work shall be done for six days, but the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Set apart to Yahuwah. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Therefore, the children of Yisrael shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Yisrael forever. For in six days, Yahuwah made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. That's uh, Shemoth or Exodus 31, 13. And you remember earlier, we just said, we quoted from, you know, uh, chapter 24 of Mati'u, where you, Yahushua said, not one yod or tittle shall depart from while, until heaven and earth pass away. Well, now this is when you were betrothed with the nation of Israel. okay? Uh, we, we mentioned that people say, well, they excuse it, and they say, well, we only have to obey the Noahide laws or the Rainbow Covenant, you know, the seven Noahic laws, because we're Gentiles. No, you have to become Yisrael. That's what you must do, because it's the nation of Yisrael that has been commissioned to teach all the nations the covenant. And then there's only going to be one person on the earth, one body on the earth, and that's Yisrael. There's not even supposed to be Gentiles. You know? Exodus 24, he took, and he took the book of the covenant, and he read it in the hearing of the people, and they said, all that Yahuwah has spoken, we shall do and obey. This is the wife accepting the marriage and agreeing to obey. Now, look carefully at this. And Moshe took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, See the blood of the covenant which Yahuwah has made with you concerning all these words. That's why we have to receive Yahushua's blood, you know. And here's what Yahushua said in Luke 23, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. And they divided his gar garments and cast lots. He was praying for that fellow that was nailing these big, giant, nine-inch nails into his arms. In Deuteronomy 29, it says, And not with you alone I am making this covenant and this oath. But with him who stands here with us today before Yahuwah our Elohim, as well as with him who is not here with us today. And that's each of us. Each of us individually has to enter into that covenant. You know? And it's our commission to find more and to go and teach all the nations to obey everything we were commanded to obey. You see? Now, in 2 Timothy... Uh, there's going to be a test on our knowledge of the truth. Now, in chapter 3 of 2 Timothy, But know this, that in the last days, hard times shall come. For men shall be lovers of self, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, thankless, wrongdoers, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, fierce, haters of good, betrayers, reckless, puffed up, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of Elohim, having a form of reverence but denying its power. 
or its authority. Uh, sounds like uh, you turned on the TV and saw the daily news. Um, turn away from these, for among them are those who creep into households and captivate silly women loaded down with sins, led away by various lusts, always learning and never able to come to a knowledge to the knowledge of the truth. The knowledge of the truth uh, is being sought a mile from here by tens of thousands of people. And they're not finding it though. I've sat in that assembly down there and you know there's a huge assembly. Uh, and they don't tell you the truth. It's kind of a mixture. Now Luke 18, 8b says something very interesting. It's something Yahushua asked. But when the son of Adam comes, shall he find the belief on the earth? Well that's what we're talking about. The belief, the test, the Torah. Is he going to find it? Well, he's not going to find much of it. Now, here's the thing. Um, the belief is, is the covenant, okay? And it's been abandoned. It, the truth has fallen in the streets. Now, the way of life is the belief. Um, I wanted to mention, too, if you, I mentioned Psalm 80. Psalm 80 is so important. It's our restoration a prayer. He, he's called the son of Adam. That's what he called himself. Well, in the, in the Psalm 80, it says son of Adam also. And it's referring to the Messiah, the resurrected Messiah. Now, the way of life is the belief. And as Johanna, uh, Johann, uh, it's, uh, Yohanan, or Yohanan, and Mamre opposed Moshe, so do these also oppose the truth. Uh, some people understand that religion opposes the, the covenant. Men of corrupt minds found worthless concerning the belief. But they shall not go on further, for their folly shall be obvious to all, as also that of, the, of those men became. In other words, those two men that opposed Moshe. But you did closely follow my teaching, the way of life, the purpose, the belief, the patience, the love, the endurance, the persecutions, the sufferings which came to me at Antioch, at Iconian, and at Lustra, what persecutions I bore. He's talking about the faith that got him in so much trouble. Now, in 2 Timothy 3, again we see, I'm going to review this because I read it earlier, but, but evil men and imposters shall go on to the worst, the worst, leading astray and being led astray. But you stay in what you have learned and trusted having known from whom you, learn, you have learned, and that from a babe you have known the set-apart scriptures, which are able to make you wise for deliverance through belief in Messiah Yahushua. All scripture is breathed by Elohim and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for setting straight, in other words, uh, for correction too, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of Elohim might be fitted, equipped for every good work. And of course, the armor of Elohim is mentioned too. Ephesians chapter 6 talks about the armor. And that armor is, of course, those elements of the pieces of armor all relate to the same thing. The belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, shotting your feet in boots of peace, wearing the, the helmet of salvation, and holding the, fee, the shield of the faith, the faith, the belief, and wielding the sword of the Ruach HaKadosh, which is the thing Yahushua used against the, his adversary, the dragon. Uh, when we have uh, temptation, we can hold up our shield and we can wield our sword, you know, and cite the commandment that's being threatened. And the commandment will always overcome. Speak it out loud. Examination concerning the way of Yahuwah. This is the test. This is an examination. Now, why are we to test ourselves? Well, Matthew 24, 24 says, For false messiahs and false prophets shall arise, and they shall show great signs and wonders, so as to lead astray, if possible, even the chosen ones. That's why. Because these things are going to be upon us, and they are here. A multiple choice question. Who wants us to ignore the Ten Commandments? And, and the rest of the instructions for living in the way of Yahuwah. It isn't Yahuwah, it would be Shatan or Satan, and the false teachers masquerading as messengers of light. 
And what are we led astray from, just in review? And how is it accomplished? The answer is we are led astray from the Torah, or the way of Yahuwah, by means of teachers who add to or take away from, annul or cancel the instructions. That's how it's done. Taking it away or adding to it, and that's how you're led astray from it. We must not fall from our own steadfastness, steadfastness and dedication to Yahushua and that which he has given us a love for, which is his Torah. Because he's the living Torah, the living word. For our first love it lives within us. Now, in 2 Peter 3, it says, You then, beloved ones, being forewarned, watch, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away, there's that led, led away again, with the delusion of the lawless, but grow in the favor and knowledge of our Master and Savior, Yahushua HaMashiach. To Him be the esteem, both now and in a, to a day that abides. Amen. And, and this is uh, backed up here, too, uh, where we should be careful and examine ourselves. 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourselves whether you are in the belief. Test yourselves or prove yourselves. Or do you not know yourselves that Yahushua Messiah is in you unless you are disapproved? And Revelation 22, 14 is critical because if you pass the test, here's the reward. Blessed are those doing his commands, so that the authority shall be theirs unto the tree of life, and to enter through the gates into the city, and the city will be the new Jerusalem, Yahuwah Shema, which means Yahuwah is there. Now, to go into the gates of the city, if you have not been engrafted into the covenant, and you're not Yisrael, you're not making it because those 12 gates are named for the 12 tribes of Yisrael. And the tree of life is not religion, you know? That's the other tree. This is not the tree of life that you're looking at. This is an A-S-H-E-R-A-H. -H. It's got the, the testicles and, and uh, semen and all that stuff. It's, it's actually a phallic uh, sexual representation. And it's, uh, it's a false deity of the Sidonians, which were the Jezebel's people. And it went into all the world because the northern tribes carried it out into the seas and into the land, and they went with this stuff. After living with it for, genera for generations and generations, the uh, people of Jezebel brought this tree out. And it's a scheme. So he has his tree, the, dra the dragon has his tree. And he's an imitator. Now here's how we failed our first test. And it's the same test. Whether we're going to choose religion or whether we're going to choose to obey. And he said, who made you know that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you that you should not eat? Now the promise was you shall be like Elohim. That's witchcraft. So the tree of religion is all, all religions are witchcraft. Rebellion. That's what rebellion is. It's witchcraft. That's uh, Genesis chapter 3. And the result was dying. And we're slowly dying. As soon as we're born, we're on the road to dying. In fact, every day we die a little bit. Even though we appear to be alive, we're actually dying. Our cells are dying. The second law of thermodynamics is working on us. That was part of the fall, too. Uh, the universe is seeking to dismantle us. Everybody knows this. Every scientist knows this. Now, in Psalm 103, it, it, it says that Yahuwah remembers, as a father has compassion for his children, so Yahuwah has compassion for those who fear him, for he knows how we are made. He remembers that we are dust. We're the ones that forget that. Genesis 3 says, By the sweat of your face you were to eat bread until you returned to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you shall return. Now, Genesis 3 says also in verse 23, So Yahuwah Elohim sent him out of the garden of Eden to till the ground from which he was taken. And he drove the man out, and he placed carabim at the east of the garden of Eden, and a flaming sword which turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So the tree of life is something we're actually going to get to see and eat from. How about that? But uh, for right now, we have 
you know, some, well, Yahushua's actually done all the work of redemption and will continue to, but we have to believe and obey. That's our mission. So we have to do what the first parents didn't do. It's the same test. We have to guard the way of Yahuwah. That's what Nazarim do. Because the word Nazarim, while it means watchmen, it means guardians also. We're guarding something. We're guarding his name and we're guarding his Torah. Those who guard the way of Yahuwah are those of the household of Abraham. In Genesis 18, and Yahuwah said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing since Abraham is certainly going to become a great and mighty nation? And all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. For I have known him that he commands his children and his household after him to guard the way of Yahuwah. To do righteousness and right ruling so that Yahuwah brings to Abraham what he has spoken to him. And then Galatians 3 reflects that. And if you are of Messiah, then you are the seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. So is there any year regularly? I mean, there's not, this is con continually consistent. It, it's guarding the way of Yahuwah all the way through Scripture. Our goal is to be restored to that as the prodigal returning to the household and to be found worthy to eat from the tree of life. That's our goal. And Yahushua is the tree of life because he's the living way, the living Torah. He's the way, the truth, and the life. He's one, he's all, it's all one thing, but it's him. All life comes from him. He's the resurrection and the life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the assemblies. To him who overcomes, I shall give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of Elohim. That was Revelation 2, verse 7. Now, the manna test is really interesting because this uh, is something that a lot of people overlook. And this is the way of Yahuwah, okay? Exodus or Shemoth, chapter 16, verse 4. And Yahuwah said to Moshe, See, I am raining bread from the heavens for you, and the people shall go out and gather a day's portion every day in order to try them. That means to test them, whether they walk in my Torah or not. So if they go out in, on, on the Sabbath to look for this, or anything else, then they have failed the test. They went out. You can go out of your house, but it doesn't say you could be, be wandering out for your whatever you're, you're looking for. But, you know, there's a, there's a Sabbath distance mentioned in Acts chapter 1, which I adhere to. Some people don't. But uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 12 says, And they departed in, from the Mount of Olives and went back to the city, a Sabbath distance. Well, it's interesting because it kind of relates to Exodus 16. And it came to be that some of the people went out on the seventh day to gather, but they found none. And Yahuwah said to Moshe, how long shall you refuse to guard my commands and my Torah? See, because Yahuwah has given you the Sabbath, therefore he is giving you bread for two days on the sixth day. Let each one stay in his place. Do not let anyone go out of his place on the seventh day. Uh, so the people rested on the seventh day. In other words, they, they rested their bodies, you know. Anyway, uh, 321 A.D., Constantine I, uh, he, he already had something called the Day of the Sun. Sunday was a pagan day. It was the Day of the Sun. The Sun was worshipped by the Roman Empire. And, of course, the Egyptians and Greeks and Babylonians. On the venerable day, now this is what the writings of uh, Constantine. On the venerable day of the Sun, let the magistrates... That's like governors and, you know, mayors. And people residing in cities rest. And let all workshops be closed. In the country, however, persons engaged in agriculture may freely and lawfully continue their pursuits. Because it often happens that another day is not so suitable for grain sowing or for vine planting. Lest by neglecting the proper moment for such operations, the bounty of heaven should be lost. Now, that was the first Sunday law given on the seventh day of the third month of the Roman calendar in A.D. 321. The venerable day of the sun. And uh, 
That's kind of weird. Now, because Abraham believed and obeyed Yahuwah, he passed the test. So he was given a test too. And uh, in your, and it says in Genesis or Bereshith chapter 22, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. That is the Abraham, Abrahamic covenant because we partake of that because he obeyed Yahuwah. Genesis 22 cont continues, uh, or earlier says, And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son, but the messenger of Yahuwah called to him from the heavens and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the boy, nor touch him. For now I know that you fear Elohim, seeing you have withheld your son, not withheld your son, your only son, from me. So Yahuwah himself did something exactly that, 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 that same thing, only he went and carried it out. Genesis 22, 13 continues, And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and saw behind him a ram caught in a bush by its horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. So the substitutionary offering was laid down there for us. And Abraham called the name of the place Yahuwah Yireh as it is said to this day on the mountain of Yahuwah provides. And the messenger of Yahuwah called to Abraham a second time from the heavens and said, By myself I have sworn, declares Yahuwah, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, that I shall certainly bless you and I shall certainly increase your seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is on the seashore and let your seed possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. I wonder if Adolf Hitler ever read that. How the, here's how the prodigal son returns to the household of Yahuwah. By Teshuba, which is, Shub is the root, and it means to repent or turn back and repent. Now the chosen ones are those who guard the way of Yahuwah and are of the household of belief, the belief, offspring of Abraham and have become children of Yahuwah. We overcome because Yahushua's spirit living within us enables us to overcome through love. First we love Yahuwah because he first loved us, but we reflect and respond to his love by loving him and obeying him. And then we thereby love our brothers and sisters. And that's the way of Yahuwah. That's the way of Yahuwah, love. Okay? And teshuba is repentance. And it's signified by our immersion. When we are immersed, we are is an outward sign of our pledge to love Yahuwah and to love our neighbor. And that sums up the uh, entire covenant. Now, a final restoration, a final restoration is to occur at the end of days, in Matthew 24, Yahushua's disciples had asked him, what's, when is this going to happen? And what's the sign of your coming? And many false prophets shall arise and lead many astray. And because of the increase in lawlessness, the love of many shall become cold. But he who shall have endured to the end shall be saved. And this good news, or message, of the rain shall be proclaimed in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end shall come. So adding to or taking away from the Torah is how the false teachers lead astray. If they were teaching you to obey the covenant, that would be a whole different matter, you see? But they're not. Now, Daniel 12 also says, and this reflects the last days and the distress and the tribulation. Now, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great head who is standing over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of distress, such as has never been since there was a nation until that time. At that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall wake up. That's the first resurrection. Some to everlasting life and some to reproaches and everlasting abhorrence. And those who have insight shall shine like the brightness of the expanse. And those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. But you, Daniel, 
hide the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Many shall diligently search and knowledge shall increase. Now, wisdom, understanding, and knowledge are being revealed in these last days. And that's what's happening right now. So the seal has been removed from Daniel's book, apparently, because righteousness is starting to spring forth upon the earth. And we're seeing it. So uh, we have to know whether or not the truth is in our heart or whether we've put something else in our heart. Our heart is our lamp. The, ten wise virg uh, the, uh, the five wise virgins and the five unwise virgins, the, they uh, didn't have the oil in their lamps. And the oil is the Torah, the, which is the, the mind of the Ruach HaKadosh. You know, that's Yahuwah. In Yahu or Jeremiah 31, 33, it says, For this is the covenant I, I shall make with the house of Yisrael after those days, declares Yahuwah. I shall put my Torah in their inward parts and write it on their hearts, and I shall be their Elohim and they shall be my people. So those are the five wise virgins because they've got the oil in their lamp. The Torah has been poured into their hearts. So the Torah is the living words, and here's the proof of that. Uh, I was listening to Dave Stone this morning uh, on the radio. It was a recording of a sermon he made. And the, the sermons are called, uh, I think it's called the Living Way or the Living Words or something. Does anybody remember what that's called, the program? It's called the Living Word. Well, the Living Words are mentioned in the scriptures. Acts 7 records da uh, Stephen, Stephen talking to the, 70, uh, the Sanhedrin of Israel. This is the Moshe who said in the ch to the children of Israel, Yahuwah your Elohim shall raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. Him you shall hear. And that's Yahushua. This is he who was in the assembly in the wilderness with the messenger who spoke to him on Mount Sinai. And with our fathers who received the living words. Those are the, that's the Ten Commandments. To give to us to whom our fathers would not become obedient but thrust away. And in their hearts they turned back to Mitzrayim. And surely Stephen was referring to the Ten Commandments, which Christianity has also thrust away. Now, our commission as Nazarene, I have to keep repeating this because this is very important. It's our delegated, ordained marching orders. Now, Matthew 28 says, Therefore, go and make taught ones of all the nations, immersing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the set-apart Spirit, teaching them to guard all that I have commanded you. And see, I am with you always until the end of the age. Amen. So the Nazarim are to go and find learners who will hear and then teach them the name. That's Yahusha, our deliverer. Yah is our deliverer. And teach them the Torah of Yahuwah. I mentioned Occam's razor uh, in that last frame because uh, there was a man named Occam. His name was William of Occam. And uh, for simplicity's sake, I wanted to explain real, real quickly a little bit about what, how we can get to the real truth. Uh, now, this is outside scripture, but it's still a good teaching tool. Now, this man lived back in the 13th century, and um, he's remembered as a great logician. And he's, and he's got a maxim that people have, they call it the Occam's Razor. And it was uh, it, originally in Latin, apparently. But it, what it means is entities must not be multiplied beyond necessity. Now, to simplify what he just said, it is the idea that in trying to understand something, to get to, to, to the real truth, we have to get unnecessary information out of the way. And it's the fastest way to the truth or to the best explanation of a problem. If there's a problem, the simplest solution is the best answer. That's basically it. It's Occam's razor. It's just get, get right to the point, you know. And I usually try to do that, but uh, it takes me about an hour and a half. But um, one consequence of this methodology is the idea that the simplest or most obvious explanation of several competing ones is the one that should be preferred until it is proven wrong. Now, let me back up and say that real point out again. The simplest way to find out what the truth is among several competing things is 
to just take, take the one that's the simplest until it's proven wrong. Now, the example that we have here is Psalm 119, 142. Well, psalm 119 is like my favorite psalm. Uh, maybe that and Psalm 80. I don't know. Psalm 23. Oops, I have a lot of them. But um, it says here in one verse, Your righteousness is righteousness forever, and your Torah is truth. Now, if Occam's razor is to be used on this situation, then we have to assume that we, we can go by that until the real thing comes along. You know, If this one will work, then let's use that. If his Torah is truth, then we can live by his Torah. Now, that would mean that Kundalini Yoga is not truth because it's competing. See, when you've got several competing things, then you just simply have to look down the list and say, let me think here. Kundalini yoga? Nah. All right, how about the Bhagavad Gita? Well, no, that's not going to work. Is the Quran truth? No. How about the Book of Mormon? No, that added. See, adding and taking away, that's how you get veered off. And the Mormons don't have the sign of the eternal covenant, do they? Which is the Sabbath. So announcing their everlasting lasting message. Now, the everlasting message is never going to end. Revelation 14, it says, And I saw another messenger flying in mid-heaven, holding the everlasting good news, that's the message, to announce to, to those living on the earth, dwelling on the earth, even to every nation and tribe and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear Elohim and give us esteem to him, because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made the heaven and the earth and sea and fountains of water. Now this, students, and I'm one of you, is the test. This is when the test starts, because he's giving you the last message. Fear Elohim and give esteem to him, because the hour of his judgment. Now the hour of his judgment means that sit, he's going to sit down and start grading the test. Because this is the time that you can actually take the test, too, if you need to. But, you, you know, this is it, his judgment. And that means that it's going to, it, the test is, is, is happening, you know. Now, let us hear the conclusion of the entire matter again. Fear Elohim and guard his commands, for this applies to all mankind. For Elohim shall bring every work into right ruling, including all that is hidden, whether good or whether evil. There's some people that don't really like the smell of that, uh, that uh, because we have the smell of Messiah upon us. It says in Scripture that we have a, this, the stench of death on us. But uh, actually to one another, we have the smell of sw sw sweetness and life. It's amazing. It, it actually says that. So uh, those that don't like the smell of us uh, would not be people who would love the covenant, you know. Now, remember how you are deceived. This is important. Adding to the Torah or taking away from the Torah. And the Sunday Sabbath certainly ta uh, takes away and adds. It does both. But, and here's how you're to be restored. And my, it's Second Chronicles 7. And my people, upon whom my name is called... Shall, hum and shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways. Then I shall hear from the heavens and forgive their sin and heal their land. So if we, return, if we renew our mind with, with the truth, you know, then he, he will, and we pray and we seek his face, then he's going to hear. And in, in Second Chronicles 7 continues, now, this is a Sukkoth period, which we just got out of here, uh, that's being recorded here. And on the eighth day, they held an assembly, for they performed the dedication of the altar seven days, and the festival seven, seven days. Okay, <laughs> that's Sukkoth, that's the seven-day seven festival of Sukkoth. And on the 23rd day of the seventh month, he sent the people away to their tents. Oops, I don't know what that is. I'm not doing anything. Anyway, they sent them away on the eighth day. This is the Simchat Torah, or the eighth day of the festival, which is the day that Messiah was circumcised. He was born on the first day of Sukkoth, circumcised on the eighth day. 
And they were rejoicing and glad of heart for the goodness that Yahuwah had done for Daud and for Shlomo, that's David and Solomon, and for his people, Yisrael. Thus Shlomo, or Solomon, finished the house of Yahuwah and the sovereign's house, and all that came into the heart of Shlomo to do in the house of Yahuwah and in his own house, he pros prosperously executed. Now, he was born during the time of Sukkoth. There's a, a little photo of a man uh, and, a, and a woman and a baby, and that's uh, representing the birth of Yahusha. And his second coming is also going to probably occur during Sukkoth because he's going to tabernacle among men. And Sukkoth means booths or tabernacle. Now, Yahuwah appeared to Shlomo by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of slaughtering. If I shut up the heavens and, and there is no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among the people, and my people upon whom my name is called shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, then I shall hear from the heavens and forgive their sin and heal their land. Now my eyes are open and my ears attentive to the prayer of this place. And now I have chosen and set this house apart for my name to be there forever. And my eyes and my heart shall always be there. And you, if you walk before me as your father Daud walked, and do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you guard my laws and my right rulings, then I shall establish the throne of your reign as I covenanted with Daud your father, saying there is not to cease a man of yours as ruler in Israel. See, the tribe of Yehuda is the ruling tribe. But if you turn away and forsake my laws and my commands which I have set before you and shall go and serve other mighty ones and, I, and bow yourself to them, then I shall pluck them from my land which I have given them and this house which I have set apart for my name I shall cast out of my sight and make it to be a proverb and a mockery among all peoples and this house, which has been exalted, everyone who passes by it shall be astonished and say, Why has Yahuwah done this to this land and to this house? And we're doing that today. We all look to Jerusalem and we go, What in the world is that giant tumor doing on that temple mount? <laughs> then they shall say, Because they forsook Yahuwah the Elohim of their fathers. That's why, who brought them out of the land of Mitzrayim and embraced other mighty ones and bowed themselves to them and served them. Therefore, he has brought all this evil upon them. See, you bow to this tree, if you have one, and put the gifts underneath it. When you, you can't, I mean, Satan has got, the dragon has got this little thing worked out, so you're actually bowing to one of his idols. Not us, I mean, I don't mean, I don't mean you. Malachi 4, remember the Torah of Moshe, my servant, which I commanded him in Horeb for all Yisrael, laws and right rulings. See, I am sending you El Yahu the prophet before the coming of the great and awesome day of Yahuwah. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with utter destruction. Now that's the message of El, El Yahu. And it's, it's mentioned here too in Luke, Luke, chapter, Luke chapter 1, when the messenger is talking to John the Baptist's father, Zechariah. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Eliyahu, or Eliyahu, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and, and the disobedient to the insight of the righteous, to make ready a people prepared for Yahuwah. The bride is to prepare herself. And the disobedient is going to, are going to get here and abide by the insight of the righteous. Now, that's the message of Eliah too, the power of Eliah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Now, the children are, is Israel, okay? And to make ready the bride and restore the lost to the Torah. This is happening now. In Psalm 119, again, your righteousness is righteousness forever and your Torah is truth. Now, we mentioned that earlier. Now, which is the lie? Yahusha is a way or the way? Well, it's, he's not just a way. He's the only way. And he is the living truth, the living Torah. If you're going to pass the test, you'll not only be found living in obedience, but you will have taught others also, multiplying 
what you have been entrusted with. So it's not just about you. Matthew 25 says, Then he who had received two talents came and said, Master, you delivered to me two talents. See, I have gained two more talents. Besides them, his master said to him, Well done, good and trustworthy servant. You were trustworthy over a little. I, set you, I, I shall set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. So it's not really about money, you know. Now, success and failure, you've got the choice. You can either choose obedience or you can choose death or disobedience, which is life and death. Success is abiding by this, Matthew 19. But if you wish to enter into life, guard the commands. And you can't do it, of course, without Yahushua in you. Mashiach in you is the key. But the, the Ruach HaKodesh, according to Acts 5.32, is only given to those who obey him. So you have to obey, and then he will give you the Ruach HaKodesh. Because it's a choice. You know, it's the, like the moment that the, the deceiver came to the woman in the garden, if she'd said, let me think. Oh, that's against Torah. Bye. See you later. Uh, failure is, Matthew, is mentioned in Matthew 7. Uh, and then I shall declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work lawlessness. Okay? And uh, here's an interesting picture here. Go Goliath, or Goliath, actually is a Hebrew word and a name that actually means really big. You know, huge. Now, and I've got who let the dogs out. Because he, uh, he asked uh, D David or Daoud, am I a dog? <laughs> the Philistine asked him, am I a dog that you come against me with sticks and rocks? Anyway, Daoud means my beloved. Now, if, we're, if we observe pagan customs, then we are spotted and wrinkled. The bride must become pure and be restored to the covenant. So the bride wouldn't be operating with trees and pumpkins and little rabbits and things and eggs, signs of fertility. Anything that has to do with fertility has to do with paganism. And I'll bet you that, that he had, uh, this giant probably did have one of those little baskets with little eggs in it, you know. Now, in 2 Corinthians 10, we see, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not fight according to the flesh. And we just saw a big battle over there, you know, but it was a fleshly battle. But we don't fight fleshly. We fight with other arm, armament. For the weapons we fight with are not fleshly, but mighty in Elohim for overthrowing strongholds. And strongholds are reasonings, things that, thought prisons, things that people have told us that we, ha that we believe. And every high matter that exalts itself against the knowledge of Elohim, at taking captive every thought to make it obedient to the Messiah and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete. Now that last phrase, being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is complete, would mean that we're not going to be judging other people. We're going to let Yahushua judge them. And that's really uh, came in handy for this woman who was caught in adultery. Uh, these men knew that they were sinners when he pointed it out to them. Let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Some rejected the rock, though, in Deuteronomy 32. You forgot the rock who brought you forth and forgot the El who fathered you, and you who saw and despised because of the provocation of his sons and his daughters. And he said, Let me hide my face from them. Let me see what their end is, for they are a perverse generation, children in whom there is no trusting. They made me jealous by what is not El, and they provoked me with their worthless matters. But I will make them jealous by those who are not a people, and I provoke them with a foolish nation. Now that, that's the, what, what's going to happen here before, just before we become one tree. Ephraim, or the returning tribes, uh, the house of Israel is coming back to the covenant, and the older brother that's, the, that's still living in the house with the father is going to get jealous. But we're arrogant. <laughs> so we have to overcome these, this vexing. Now, in the picture here, we see uh, an illustration of Yehuda talking to one of the servants, saying, what in the world's going on? And 
the father is bestowing all this love upon this son who was lost. And it makes Yehuda jealous, see? Now, and he said to him, your brother has come, and your father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he received him back in health, meaning he f received him back alive. Yehuda must overcome his jealousy, and Ephraim <laughs> must overcome his arrogance because uh, Yehuda has never left the father's Torah, you know? He's added and taken away, but not nearly as much as Ephraim has, the lost tribes. Now, Yehusha's work is seen in his Nazarene. Matthew 15, it says, and he answering said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Yisrael. Now that's a mystery to some of you, but most of you probably already know. The house of Yisrael represents the lost sheep, the ones that went into the nations beginning in this over 2,700 years ago. And subsequently after the Babylonian captivity too, because all of them didn't come back. They became as Gentiles. Now, Yeshayahu 11, this is the one I referred to earlier, and he shall raise a banner for the nations. That's a flag, some kind of an ensign or a sign. And this could be it. I don't know. But, and gather the outcasts of Israel, to gather them. He's going to gather them. And assemble the dispersed of Yehuda. That's two things. That's two camps. You've got the lost sheep, which he refers to as the lost tribes of Israel, outcasts of Israel, and assemble the dispersed of Yehuda, who also don't know who they are. From the four corners of the earth, and the envy of Ephraim, that's a term for the house of Israel, because they're the lead tribe, uh, closest to the, the southern border in the land. The envy of Ephraim shall turn aside and the adversaries of Yehuda be cut off and Ephraim shall not envy Yehuda and Yehuda not trouble Ephraim. So these two trees are going to become one tree, the fig tree. Now uh, this is a, one of the things that we have to overcome because as we get back to the house, the household of the faith, we have to be careful that we don't go, let me just correct you, Brother Yehuda. You don't have the moon right. Don't you know it's the weeks are set by the moon? And we also have learned from the Naval Observatory that your new moons are all messed up and your full moons. We, we have to see the moon. Don't you know? Well, there's all kinds of fruit inspectors out there. There, there are people looking at the fruit and saying, you know, your fruit is really not quite good enough. Well, we have to overcome this. They're, they're, everybody's a critic. But you see, Scripture is not for private interpretation. We have to get back into one body. And all of Israel should be in unity, you know, of the faith. And not, we shouldn't judge one another either. Now, Colossians chapter 2 says, Let no one therefore judge you in eating or in drinking or in respect of a festival or a new moon or Sabbaths, which are a shadow of what is to come for the body of the Messiah. Now it says, a little, the phrase is a little different in most translations. These shadows are for the body of Messiah. You know, that's what they're for. And the word for is the Greek word day. And it's the channel of an act or an adversative or a con continuative. It doesn't mean but the, the, the body of Messiah. That doesn't make any sense. That, most translations use the word but there. What, what, what kind of sense would that make? Which are a shadow of what is to come but the body of Messiah. <laughs> well, the translators are not necessarily inspired. They, they're flawed human beings, but... The idea that these shadows, which are the redemption plan, the high Sabbath, the annual Sabbath, are a redemption plan, and they're shadows. So we shouldn't argue over shadows, you know. The most important test to see if we have learned the lesson. Now, what is the most important test? I mean, what, is, what would it be? How would we know if we've learned the lesson? The lesson, of course, is still Torah. Luke 6 says, and do not judge and you shall not be judged at all. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned at all. Forgive, and you shall be forgiven. Now that's the ultimate. That is the highest and hardest thing for us to do, because 
Among the Nazarim, there are so many people who are unloving and are so judgmental of one another's fruit. They're all fruit inspectors. And they're all inspecting so many, they're all, they're all inspectors. They're all saying, nope, you got that wrong. And then they all stay away from them. And they guide their sheep to stay away. Don't stay away. Go. You know, learn. Like, uh, just find out what, what's true and keep that. And, you know, as, as well as you can understand it. Because what you're responsible for is what you can understand. Now, in uh, Yahushua's brother James, or Yaakov, He's another Israel, uh, in a way, because, of course, the first James, or first Yaakov, was named Israel. Now, this is another Yaakov. He says in chapter 4, Brothers, do not speak against one another. Don't do it. Because Messiah died for them. He that speaks against a brother and judges his brother, speaks against Torah and judges Torah. And if you judge Torah, you're not a doer of Torah, but a judge. And there's no judge but Yahushua, see? We've got serious problems to overcome. So we're going to become one tree, but if we go back to Yehuda, or, you know, a person that's been in the covenant, unbroken, and then we're returning, and he sees us and says, hey, what are you doing keeping these festivals? And then we say, well, we're a day off, because you all don't know what you're doing. <laughs> Yehuda's been doing it for thousands of years, and we've been doing it, what? few decades, you know. Most of us are coming out of Christianity one denomination or another. Catholicism, Baptist, Seventh-day Adventist, uh, some denomination or, or just nominal Christianity. And uh, we're coming back and we're trying to explain to the older brother how to keep the Sabbath or when the Sabbath is or whatever. You know, and that's just nonsense. You know, they've been doing it thousands of years, okay? And they haven't changed. Let's just let's, let's listen to the older brother a little bit anyway. Now Ephesians 4 says, And he gave himself, uh, he himself gave some as emissaries, that's the apostles, those are people who are sent, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as shepherds and teachers, for the perfecting of the set apart ones, to the work of the service to a building up of the body of the Messiah. Body of Messiah is Israel, okay? Until we all come to the unity of the belief, that's the, what we're talking about, and of the knowledge of the son of Elohim. Now that's something too, because what he did, Yehuda has not all accepted that. Now, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the completeness of Messiah, so that we should no longer be children tossed and borne about by every wind of teaching, by the trickery of men, in other words, somebody wrote a book and says, hey, let me show you that what the moon is all about. In cleverness to the craftiness of leading astray, but maintaining the truth in love, we grow up in all respects into him who is the head, Messiah, with whom the entire body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the building of, of, of itself in love. So uh, what he's saying too is that there's different people doing different things. They're, we all are not the same body part. We are in the body, but we're not all the same function. So we shouldn't be real critical or become angry or disfellowship someone because we don't understand what they're doing. It's Yahushua operating in that brother or sister. So his talents and gifts and his tools that are in his toolbox are completely different from some of the tools you have. So you have to, you know, if it's not for you, um, uh, you know, that's not a tool that you're using that, because it hasn't been given to you, you shouldn't criticize the, the brother or sister that has the tool or the gift. But uh, it is all for the upbuilding of the body, though. <clears throat> the bride of Yahushua is his Nazarene. Now, in Revelation 12, 17, it says, And the dragon was enraged with the woman, that's Israel, and went to fight with the remnant of her seed. Now, seed is usually referred to as the, as the commandments, you know, but it can also be physical offspring. But, but, the, but the word Nazarim also means branches, as in descendants of teachings, um, teachings or Torah. And, 
it's specifically talking to those guarding the commands of Elohim and possessing the witness of Yahushua Messiah. So the Nazarene do two things. They guard the commands of Elohim, and that's why we're guardians, watchmen, and we possess the witness of Yahushua HaMashiach. So we're the wise managers, mentioned in Luke 12, and the five wise maidens are mentioned in Matthew 25. So, and Messiah said, we are the light of the world because we have the covenant in us. See, our lamp is lit. Our lamp is our inner heart, the, the, the wellspring of our being. And our body is not, be, you can't see our lamp, our, it's within us. But the evidence of the fire that's burning in the lamp, the light, is actually seen in the people by whether or not they obey the commandments. And that's, the, that's how we light up uh, those around us. And I just thought I'd end it with this, to, to prove to you that the end is getting closer and closer, and those that are doing wrong will do more wrong, and those that are doing righteousness will do more righteousness. But if a picture is worth a thousand words, here's two pictures. Now, the two forms of jihad in the Islamic faith are the violent form, and then there's the cultural form. And that is accomplished by the slow Islamization of the whole world. And uh, the next phase of that will be a ground zero mosque uh, put in New York City. That, that's pretty obvious to many of us, but the world leaders are actually coming together. And the modern day Haman is a member of the Brotherhood, of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. You know, This is a slow Islamization, it's, got a, it's a grand plan. And it's been in place, the Masons, the Jesuits, uh, the Jesuits are really behind all of this because they invented Islam. I don't know if you all know this, but the Jesuits didn't exist themselves. The Jesuits weren't in existence themselves in that name, but the Catholic uh, magisterium actually invented Islam in the seventh century and it was to get, basically to get the Pope back into, into Jerusalem because they wanted to wipe out the people that were there and the Arabs were the best thing. They usually get people to motiv motivate them to rise up and do their bidding. And then they blame other people. That's what they do. Like the Council on Foreign Relations and the League of Nations and the United Nations and all that. Uh, they, they just have somebody else that they can blame, but even though they are the operative agents within those groups, uh, like Nazi Germany. How many people in the school books see that the Jesuits were the leaders of the, of the Nazi Germany and, you know, the SS. Uh, you don't read about that because, see, it's all filtered out, you know. It's all controlled. But what you're seeing in the world right now is actually part of this conspiracy. And the dragon is, in, is, is the, you know, the Jesuit general would have um, direct access to, you know, being the dragon's main input into this world it's because he can control the earth and he sees with a thousand eyes. So all these things that we see in the world happening, we can see that the end is very, very near and, uh, it, and it looks like they're about to close the, uh, the net on the whole world and the United Nations is going to probably ultimately uh, be the beast that is going to, you know, be the restored Roman Empire. So it'll have the whole world in its grip and it'll be ferocious and we won't have an internet possibly or if we do it would be uh, highly controlled and we will not be as free as we are right at this, at, at this moment. But uh, while we're here we're trying to get the message out so that it'll be you know yeast that can grow among the people that we're around. But anyway the end is very very near. So I hope we all pass the test and uh, are there any uh, comments or questions? Yes, sir? Now, on one of the slides it said, let no one judge you in eating or drinking. Mm -hmm. Okay. What that is not saying is it's okay to eat pork. No. So right. It's not saying that. It's saying don't eat the stuff or do the things that will get you. Exactly. Yes. It took me a long time to understand that. <laughs> Yeah, and that is twisted by a lot of Christian theologians. To, to it, they seem to read into it that you can eat whatever you want or work any day you want, pick any day you want to rest. Yeah, very good question.
Okay, well, thank you for coming. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>